Welcome to SSI Meetup. This is the first um, webinar we are doing, and we have the pleasure to have Roman Reed with us, who is the Chief Trust Officer um, with Evanem and uh, Sovereign Foundation Trustee, and he has been in the um, digital identity space um, for a long time. He will tell us more about himself later, and it's a pleasure to have him uh, with us here today, and especially for our first edition, which I hope will be the first of many that we will be doing about SSI to make SSI more interesting for everyone in the world and create communities around the world, which is the main goal of what we're doing here. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that um, the objectives of SSI Meetup are the following. First is to empower global SSI communities. And to do that, um, we are open to everyone who's interested in SSI, which can be people, organizations, or companies that are working in the SSI space, or anyone else who really wants to be involved. And finally, we're trying to do this by sharing all the content we will be producing and with the Creative Commons license by share alike. Um, and we're using the um, international edition um, uh, number four. And this basically means that you can reuse all the slides um, that um, Drummond will be presenting today in your local uh, meetups around the world and use the knowledge he will be sharing here. Um, to share that knowledge with um, uh, um, with people around the world to to create SSI communities and just following the rules. So if you click on the link and um, you, you will follow the rules, which basically are like the basic open source license, which basically means um, please just credit us um, uh, for using this material. So that that means crediting SSI Meetup and crediting Drummond in this case for for sharing this material. And um, and it's just um, if, if, if um, you need to really relicense it in the same way as we are um, as we are licensing it, and we are hoping that, that by providing all this material, um, other people in the world will be able also to use your material as you improve it, and this will help to create um, a global as a science community movement where everyone can participate in in, in pushing this technology forward. Um, and this is all. Um, I'm really excited about having this first session today with Drummond and Drummond will take over now and, and, and explain us some of the most important elements um, um, that are that you need to know about but of the SSI open standards world and of which he has been a big part in. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. It's a great pleasure to be here today um, <clears throat> and help kick off this webinar series of SSI Meetup. Um, as you'll see, I'm, I'm very passionate about these topics, and uh, I'll explain a little bit why. Um, I'm going on two decades in internet identity. Um, uh, we just had, uh, uh, Alex, you weren't able to be there for this one, but the, uh, the number 26 of the internet identity workshop, that's twice a year for 13 years, and I have not missed a single one. Um, and I've got uh, about 15 years of working in different uh, standards in the internet identity space at the organizations that you see here. And we'll talk uh, more about the involvement uh, of, of standards in those organizations. Um, now in these, uh, uh, I actually wear six different hats um, uh, that, that all involve uh, these standards. At Evernim, I am um, what's called chief trust officer because I work on identity and security and privacy together. Um, I'm one of the trustees at the Sovereign Foundation, where I also chair uh, the Sovereign Trust Framework Working Group. And I know we'll be doing some webinars on trust frameworks uh, later on in this series. Uh, super excited to talk about that. Um, at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, or DIF, uh, I co-chair the, uh, um, the uh, uh, Identity uh, Working Group there, or Identifiers uh, Working Group there. Um, at the Open Standards Organization called OASIS, uh, I co-chair uh, a technical standard called XDI. And lastly, uh, I've, I've been the lead on uh, several research projects at, uh, for um, that uh, Evernim is contracted with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and they've funded several of the open standards that we're going to be talking about here today. So I want to give them a, uh, a shout out, a heads up, uh, Neil John, the head of identity and data privacy there. Uh, very uh, uh, tremendous foresight uh, in this area about what's going to be needed. So um, let's let's dive into it. Uh, I like to start out uh, when we're talking about self-sovereign uh, uh, identity uh, with a nice crisp uh, definition of, of what does it really mean, right? Can, can, we 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 are finally at the at the um, watershed point in digital identity where we can have lifetime portable identity. It's not just for people. Of course, it's important for people. It's also for organizational things or anything that needs to be identified on the internet. 
And it does not depend on centralized authorities and it can't be taken away. And some people ask, it was like, really, no one could ever take it away. I'm like, if, if, you know, if if a state actor with uh, uh, with with, uh, with with force could take away all your um, uh, private keys and forcibly control anyone that you trusted to help you uh, recover those keys, well, yeah, technically. But um, it's the the key point is all of the conventional actors or or intermediaries that you would depend on for digital identity are not needed in uh, self-sovereign identity. So that's what we mean when you can't be taken away. It's it's very different than identity that's provided by some third party or administrative authority. So I, I wanna make sure that it's clear as we, in order to lay the foundation for talking about these standards. So what really is, uh, is behind this and uh, this uh, next, uh, a slide sequence of these three models of digital identity, I credit to uh, Timothy Ruff, the CEO and, and co-founder of Evernim, uh, who, who said, I need a really simple way to, un to help people understand what is, what is the big leap that's taking place here. So let's start with the conventional siloed centralized identity is, is what most of us do on the internet today and most of our accounts out there. And, and that is you have a relationship with an organization and you have a dotted line around you because you really don't exist outside of having an account with some organization. And all of the usernames and passwords we have at all the sites and all the apps that we maintain, that's what we have. We have an account that we're renting from that organization. And if they turn it off or we close down that account, we go away. We have no uh, persistent uh, identity that we control on, on the internet under this model. Now, this was also a highly inefficient model that's led to the, you know, to the uh, hundreds of usernames and passwords and all the account hassles and the fraud and, and, uh, and weakness of our current cybersecurity infrastructure. So, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, with each of these, there are a set of standards that's evolved to make this possible. And even with just the basic, uh, um, you know, direct uh, accounts, siloed accounts, what we needed was a safe way for you and that site to talk. We needed encryption over the internet. And of course, that's that's now the lock in your browser uh, standard that started as SSL is now TLS. That probably represents uh, decades worth of standardization work just to get to those standards, uh, which are now, I, I believe, the most widely used encrypted standards in the world. So, uh, but to relieve the pain of this uh, managing uh, all these thousands of accounts, we developed the second uh, uh, generation or wave of, of internet identity and it's, it's, it's third party identity. It, it inserts a third party referred to as the identity provider, IDP. Now, now what you do is you have an account with that IDP and they in turn federate and manage uh, your login or sharing of basic attributes with any uh, organization that, that is in their federation network. Um, and <clears throat> the broadest and, and uh, you know, uh, most familiar form of this is social login using Google or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or any um, uh, a, a major social network uh, provider or, or search service provider that wants to offer that service. And it's, it does have tremendous benefits. It makes it much easier, uh, you know, for us, you can, you can just log in uh, or, or, uh, or register at sites with one or two clicks and not have to remember a separate username and password because you're just reusing that one account you set up with the IDP. Um, and, but to do this, we had to evolve a whole uh, 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 additional set of standards for how this could be done uh, in a way that, that everyone could play. And uh, again, this is, this is actually about more than a decade's worth of standards work, starting with uh, SAML that's at OASIS and then OAuth uh, that's at ITF and then OpenID Connect at the OpenID Foundation. And uh, uh, I've been involved with all those mostly with OpenID Connect and, uh, and Federation took us a long ways forward, um, this, this third party IDP model, but it still has some significant limitations. And, and, and the biggest one is right in the center of the picture. You, you now have an, a third party that's part of all these relationships, creates these giant honey pots of data, centralizes control. And once again, you still don't exist on the internet without, uh, without that account with that IDP. And, 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 and you also have the problem 
I don't know how many other folks have, have seen this. You go to a site where you want, oh, I know you use social login here, but did I use Google? Did I use Facebook? I can't remember. Was it Twitter here? And it's, you know, now it's even getting hard to manage your social logins. So, so now we evolve to the third model of moving into the world's self-sovereign identity. And interesting enough, it's back to a direct two-party peer-to-peer model. And notice we don't say org anymore. We now talk about you and the peer. And what makes self-sovereign identity possible is fundamentally distributed ledger technology, because in order for the two of you to set up and, 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 and do everything we're going to talk about here, um, you need to be able to trust each other cryptographically. And that's where the ledger comes in. The ledger actually gives us a way to, um, to, to store and uh, verify public keys that anyone else can reference. We're solving a, a fundamentally a PKI, public key infrastructure problem, in a decentralized way. And we refer to that as DPKI, decentralized PKI. And with, with that infrastructure, we can now uh, go back and have this direct peer-to-peer -peer model where you are a full first-class citizen on the internet. You have your own uh, persistent uh, I, 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 identifiers and relationships um, and that you can use for life. You completely own and control them. And so the way to, the way to picture, how does this actually work? Well, uh, oh, first I forgot to mention, in this, in this uh, uh, relationship, you don't call it an account. If I had went up and, and, and handed you a business card, I wouldn't say, hey, thanks for accepting an account from me. I would say we formed a connection and that connection is peer to peer. It works in both directions. So. Already you can see the landscape is different here. Now, when you have this connection, how do you actually form trust? Well, what you fundamentally have with self sovereign identity is you have a digital wallet. Um, in fact, you have uh, digital wallets that are operating on all your, your edge devices, whether it's your mobile phone or your tablet or your laptop or your car or your TV or any place where you need to uh, have a digital presence and control that. And uh, that digital wallet, what gives it power is it you form these connections uh, with other peers, but where the trust comes from is that just like a conventional wallet, what you're actually able to do is obtain credentials that go into your digital wallet, just like you would go and get real credentials, whether it's a passport or a driver's license or a credit card from some issuer of that credential. And then as you go to other peers and you need to prove trust, you show those credentials. Uh, you do, I mean, all of us that are using mobile phones and do a lot of travel have the experience of uh, a mobile boarding pass, pressing a button, having a QR code in our phone and, and showing it to the uh, TSA agent uh, or, or, or the, you know, the gate agent to, uh, to board a plane. That's showing a digital credential from your mobile phone. And, and of course, many of us are using the wallet functions on, uh, that Apple provides or Google provides on Apple and Android uh, phones. So what we're talking about here is moving to digital wallets that are not built into the operating system. They're not siloed by those vendors, but they uh, are designed, they're SSI wallets that work for you. And the credentials you get are now credentials you can use anywhere those credentials are accepted. Um, and you control what credential you show where. So that's the basic fundamental model of what makes uh, digital identity, I mean, self-sovereign identity work. And right here on this diagram, I'm gonna highlight the four open standards that it, it's, it's have emerged to do this. The first one is called DIDs, decentralized identifiers. And that's actually the addresses on that, on that uh, distributed ledger of those public keys that, that you're gonna be using. The second one's called DKMS, Decentralized Key Management System. And that's how you're gonna manage the keys on your, for your digital wallets, plural, on all your devices. Uh, the third one is now, how do you actually authenticate to another peer that's called DidAuth? And then the fourth one is the exchange of verifiable credentials. How do you actually standardize uh, uh, accepting those credentials, pre uh, presenting those credentials, the format, the signatures on those credentials. So they will work everywhere, just like credit cards work everywhere in a credit card network. So um, I'm very quickly now gonna show um, where are these standards? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically tell you the story behind each one of them uh, in these four chapters. So first, uh, decentralized identifiers are now at the W3C. 
DKMS uh, is just emerging now. Uh, we just uh, showed a demonstration of the uh, proposed architecture at IAW um, two weeks ago. That's planned to go um, more than likely to OASIS. It's not a final decision yet. Um, again, that's another one of the st internet standards bodies. Um, DIDOF is currently a working group at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, but is likely uh, to go to IETF, uh, another one of the standards, uh, major you know, internet standards organizations. And Verifiable Credentials is already an official working group at the W3C and uh, hopefully will be an official standard within the next year. So I'm going to uh, next give you the story behind each of these. Alex asked me, I said, tell us how these things actually happened. How did they come about? So for each one of these, I'm, I'm basically going to explain what it is, and then I'm going to give you the story of, well, how did this actually happen? So we'll start with decentralized identifiers. Uh, and I'm the co-editor of the spec, um, so I've, I've, I've lived this one most closely of all four, all four of them. So I'm going to start out by just telling you a story, the way I explain this to people. Um, for folks that are outside the U.S., you might not recognize this number, but this is a social security number. And uh, I put it up here not because it's mine, it's not, uh, but because about 40,000 people have actually used this social security number. It was, uh, it's a government ID number in, in the United States. Every, every citizen is, uh, is issued one and only one. You can, you, it's illegal to have more than one social security number. Um, this one was actually printed on a, a little insert in a, in a wallet that was sold back in the 1930s uh, by a US, U.S. company called uh, Woolrich. And uh, they, um, the, the, the wallet had a little plastic window in it. And they said, we want to show what you can do with this. And so they put a little half size social security card inside that and used the boss's secretary social security number. And uh, many people bought that wallet and said, ah, I'll just go use that. Uh, uh, that's, I'll use that as my social security number. So the point is, it, per, it, it shows that there is no way um, that's been established for you to prove that your social security number is yours in the United States. And uh, it's been true of many government IDs around the world. You're just given this number and, uh, and, and you're supposed to tell people that's yours. And if other people ask, well, you give them the same number and that's how it works. Now, I want to contrast that with this number. Uh, this is called a DID. It's actually a DID on the sovereign uh, uh, network. And um, you can actually prove that you own and control this because this DID is the address of a, of a public key on a ledger, in this case, the sovereign ledger. And you can prove you can control it because you have the private key. And uh, therefore, you're going to be able to use DIDOF, which we'll talk about in a minute, to, to prove to anyone, yeah, I'm the one who registered that DID. I control the private key for it, and I can prove that to you cryptographically. Now, you can just look at this set of numbers and immediately know no human being is going to remember all this, right? These are not human-friendly identifiers, any of them. Um, uh, so how will you actually wield these as, as a tool for digital identity? Well, of course, you're going to use the same thing you're probably using for your address book today. Uh, I love to ask audiences, how many phone numbers in their address book do they actually remember these days? Um, <clears throat> now, the other point I want to make about DIDs and how you'll use them is that it's very, very different than a social security number or a government ID because you won't have just one. In fact, you will have thousands of them. Um, and that's because you'll use a different DID by default for every relationship for privacy reasons. And each one of those DIDs is not just an identifier, it's actually the address of a lifetime encrypted private channel with any other person or organization or thing that you give that DID to. Um, this is this is where we go from digital identity to much stronger cybersecurity and cyber privacy and a whole new generation of, of um, apps and services that are going to be possible with this level of trust. And of course, you're going to use that channel not just to prove, yeah, it's me, but you're going to share those verifiable digital credentials we talked about to prove what the other party can trust about you based on what credentials you can share. Now, all of this is being done without any centralized registration authority. This is not like DNS, where you have to go to a, 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 a registrar and they're going to a registry and everything is, you know, 
this hierarchy that you're working between. You are directly cryptographically registering on a blockchain or distributed network. And uh, so I'm going to quickly, I, I'm not going to go into uh, great technical details, but I, I, I just like to show people um, DIDs actually came from a 20 year old uh, standard, the pattern. Uh, this is an RF, um, ITF standard for persistent identifiers on the internet. This, for example, is, is called a UUID. And you can generate these locally on a device without any central registry. And it's basically such a long number um, in, in bits, it's 128 bits, that its chance of global collision with any other UID is infinitesimally small. So these have been used in computing for the last two decades, and, uh, and they are, as I said, uh, internet uh, standard. We took that same pattern and said, hey, we can do this, but we can do it, uh, we can use that same pattern to, to design different kinds of DIDs that will work with different distributed ledgers around the world. And they're also globally unique. They can also be generated locally or on the ledger, but they can now be looked up uh, on that ledger in order to get uh, the associated uh, public key and other metadata. So there are, that they're called DID methods, the different ones, and that's it's the part between that first and second colon. And you can see I'm referencing the six initial DID methods that are actively under development today. Uh, besides Sovereign, you have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, Verus One is a new uh, global ledger just for DIDs. Um, IPFS, Blockstack, um, all these are DID compatible systems. And with every one of those systems, fundamentally what's going on is the DID itself, the decentralized identifier is essentially the key, the lookup key for a, 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 a small digital document. The format technically is called JSON-LD, JSON linked data. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a, a, a well-structured form of JSON. And what it is, it has the metadata you need to then go and interact with that other self-sovereign identity. And without going into details, just quickly, what's in a did doc? Well, there's, there is the did itself. So if you just found a did doc or it was in a database, you could go look it up and verify it. There are the public keys that you need to interact with that person. There's a set of authentication protocols if you to do did auth with that entity. And lastly, service endpoints to actually interact with their agent, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So with all of those, you, you now have the infrastructure for, you know, uh, a, a, basically the base layer for self-sovereign identity worldwide. How did this happen? Uh, the short story is, the idea of DIDs and the very term was first conceived uh, by what's called the Verifiable Claims Task Force, a group formed at W3C to, uh, to go and, and say, how do we solve this problem of interoperable digital credentials? And they came up with the idea, uh, but weren't really thinking necessarily blockchain. They were thinking uh, a, a distributed hash table for the web. Um, but they had the basic idea and it, co it coincided with several other groups that were also thinking in that direction. And that led to uh, um, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security actually putting out a, uh, uh, a research grant proposal to, to companies to say, how would we do this privacy respecting uh, identity on the blockchain? Um, my company, um, actually my predecessor company applied uh, to, to that. We were subsequently um, uh, acquired by Evernim. And we were one of four companies who, who got that grant. And then we spent uh, pretty much 2016, we started in March and finished uh, uh, at the end of November, developing uh, and working with all the, uh, the, the, the key players in the SSI community uh, to develop the, uh, the DID 1.0 specification, which thankfully by the end of that uh, time, we had uh, two conferences, Rebooting Web of Trust and, and the Internet Identity Workshop, IW, where everyone was like, wow, this, this is going to work. This is a lot of enthusiasm. Most of the companies in the space said, we're going to build on, on top of this, which led then to it being contributed uh, the following June to uh, the W3C, what's called the Credentials Community Group. Uh, the, those are informal groups at W3C. They're hosted there, but they, you don't have to be a member. Anyone can join. You just have to agree to the IPR uh, uh, rules for contributing to, to specs or to, to, to papers that are developed there. Um, when a credential community group gets mature enough and has a standard it wants to pursue, that becomes a full working group. It has to be approved at W3C. 
So um, the did spec is currently at the credentials community group. And uh, what we're considering the second generation of refinements is almost complete. So uh, all those companies I mentioned and projects are now building on top of it. All right, so that's DIDs. Let's go to the next thing, DKMS. And uh, fundamentally, DKMS tackles the other half of the problem. I call it the hidden part of the iceberg. If DIDs are the, what you see above the waterline, DIDs only work if you have a way of managing the private keys you need for all those DIDs. And that obviously has to include a way for you, an individual or an employee of organization uh, to recover keys if you lose them or, uh, or, or they're compromised. And I'm going to show you uh, just quickly the, the, the standard. Uh, it's a little more technical picture here um, of, of what this looks like from an architectural layering standpoint. And, uh, and this, in fact, is the core diagram we used in our, in our work uh, developing uh, DKMS design and architecture in our contract with uh, the Department of Homeland Security. And at this bottom layer, you've got this. This is, this is the DID layer where any, uh, as I said, any uh modern blockchain that can support um uh, you know having a unique address for a did document on it can can fulfill the needs of that did layer we show these two layers then of agents and wallets and what distinguishes these layers is that at the edge layer you, th those are the devices that are directly uh used by identity owners be they people or or, or businesses and on their own hardware um, and, and therefore, um, uh, you know, either mobile devices, tablets, uh, you know, laptops, et cetera, at the edge or servers that are behind firewalls where companies feel they can safely keep uh, uh, their, their, their private keys. So the whole point is keys at the edge. Your private keys are maintained in an edge wallet under your control. They're generated there. In ideal practice, they never, private keys never leave the wallet. Um, uh, and what happens is edge agents uh, maintain uh, back the, excuse me, encrypted backups of those wallets uh, in the cloud. And that's how individuals can have multiple edge agents and they can uh, uh, share, they can maintain an encrypted backup and they can uh, synchronize uh, what needs to be done, not the keys, but the metadata and the DIDs across multiple devices, um, enterprises, and organizations can do that for for um, you know for their devices and, and applications, and uh, both edge agents uh, can communicate cloud to cloud. Excuse me, edge to edge in a mesh, or cloud agents, of course, are ideal, just like with email, uh, um, twenty four by seven, being able to communicate at the server layer. So this stack, uh, what we created was uh, a DKMS protocol for, for generating and uh, sharing and backing up keys um, through these, these uh, two layers of agents and using uh, ledgers to, uh, to register and, and uh, uh, rotate those keys when needed. So this is the basic background on DKMS. Uh, as I said, we just published, um, I, I, don't know. I w we'll, we'll make sure there's a link uh, that's available um, in this to the uh, uh, DKMS protocol. Uh, it's in the Hyperledger Indie repository uh, at the Linux Foundation. And uh, importantly, DKMS supports both offline recovery, meaning how do you back up uh, that master key for your for your wallet, uh, you know, on paper or hardware of some kind. And a, a method called social recovery, where um, you shard that key and you share it with other individuals or institutions you trust. And if you ever, you know, lose your devices or there's some compromise, you can recover it by going to those trustees. Uh, we think both of these methods have tremendous uh, promise and will we'll finally solve the problem of decentralized key management. So DKMS happened. Uh, that this was a little bit more direct. Um, the, the concept that we needed decentralized PKI started at the first rebooting web of trust in late 2015. Uh, that's a conference that also happens every um, six months. And the, the number six was just uh, earlier in March in Boston. Um, we then, uh, my company Evernim proposed uh, our phase two of our research project after doing DIDs was DKMS. And they agreed that the, the decentralized keys and, and, and wallets were, were the next critical step. Um, uh, we, we then completed an analysis of a huge, uh, sort of the world's leading standard for key management systems, uh, for designing key management systems called NIST 800-130. 
and said, okay, here's what we need to do to do this in a decentralized manner. And then uh, uh, we completed a one-year contract and gave a uh, demonstration of uh, the DKMS design and architecture that we published on Hyperledger Indy and the prototype we developed at Internet Identity Workshop two weeks ago. So DKMS is, uh, is, is you know, still young. Uh, it's, it hasn't been submitted yet to a standards organization. I think that'll happen later this year, most likely uh, Oasis, because there is a similar centralized key management uh, standard called KMIP, Key Management Interoperability Protocol, that's at Oasis now. So that's our second chapter. Now let's look at did off, uh, because everyone wants a simpler way to go log in and authenticate any place. And in fact, that's with, with DID and DKMS, what we finally have is the decentralized public key infrastructure to support did off. So um, uh, again, back to this picture, fundamentally, once you've got this stack in place, what did off becomes is simply a way for any one agent to uh, uh, to authenticate over its connection to another agent, and whether this is you know your your browser to a web server, whether it's uh, your mobile um, you know your mobile um, uh, wallet to a mobile app or to a website, any two entities that need to um, uh, you know authenticate they they form a connection. That's actually part of the DID and DKMS uh, standard. But then if you need to authenticate it's me on the other end of that connection. It's a very simple challenge response protocol because now you're gonna sign that challenge with your private key. And, um, and, and the, the good news is everyone that was part, was, was part of the SSI community that was uh, building up from the did layer recognized this. Um, and by the, uh, the fourth Rebooting Web of Trust in Paris uh, last year, uh, all the authors of the did specs and, and the related stuff converged and said, we need did off. So um, I believe it was James Monaghan, the VP uh, product at Evernim that wrote the first paper on it. Uh, then uh, there was enough interest that by um, late last year, the, the uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation, DIF, formed a did off working group. Um, there's a Slack channel at, at uh, DIF that uh, I believe even a, if you're a non-member, you can ask to join that DIF, uh, uh, um, the DIF Slack and, and, and uh, participate in that channel. Uh, again, that DIF is not a standards organization, but they are starting to develop code to, uh, you know, to provide some mission for, for that standard. Uh, then in February of this year, um, the, the Outstanding team at uh, BC Gov, the, the British uh, Columbia um, uh, uh, government, uh, provincial government initiative for digital identity. They've been world leaders in digital identity for a long time, and they're doing so now with self-sovereign identity. And uh, the very progressive team there said, "Hey, let's advance. Let's you know speed this up by offering a bounty for a preliminary did off uh, spec and implementation." And uh, one of my good friends and actually XDI co-chairs uh, uh, at Oasis, Marcus Sabadello and a team he put together, uh, got that bounty and they did a demo of did off uh, a prototype uh, and, and have a paper written up on it that they showed it, again at Internet Identity Workshop two weeks ago. So again, did off very young, uh, lots of questions about how it's gonna interoperate or, or work with um, OpenID Connect uh, uh, with OAuth, uh, with FIDO and the new FIDO standard called, um, or, or, or outgrowth of FIDO called web authentication, which is how uh, FIDO, uh, you know, PKI based uh, uh, authentication will be built into your browser. Um, and so, so all this is, is emerging or evolving fairly rapidly, but there's a, a, um, a lot of enthusiasm around finally having a standardized PKI-based authentication. And now a uh, last one will be verifiable credentials. Um, and this is, you know, this, this is uh, sort of the meat of the sandwich. Uh, we put all the rest of this in place and now we can actually exchange uh, the credentials that will really prove human trust at the human level, not just trust at the cryptographic level. This is already an approved W3C verifiable credentials working group. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you the story of how that happened. So once again, we're here at this stack and, and you've got all these other capabilities in place. Verifiable credentials are what 
to agents exchange, once they've formed a connection, once they've got bids, uh, once they've been able to authenticate, now they can exchange credentials, just like two people would shake hands, uh, say hi to each other, maybe exchange business cards, and then really start to learn, well, you know, what are each of their experiences and why should they, uh, you know, trust each other and enter into a deeper relationship. So, this uh, is the diagram that the, the Verifiable um, uh, Claims Working Group, uh, again, they have actually evolved the name of the technology to Verifiable Credentials because it's easier to understand to compare it to the credentials in our wallet today. Um, and there are these three key roles. The issuer of a credential, um, if you compare this to, to the way we do credentials in the real world today, for instance, I'm uh, I live in the state of Washington in the United States, and I have a driver's license from the Washington State uh, Department of Mo Motor Vehicles, DMV. Uh, today, I have to go there in person, apply for a driver's license. They print out a piece of plastic, I put it in my wallet, and then I go to uh, the airport and I show it to the U.S. Uh, Transportation Security Agency, TSA agent. And uh, they look at it and verify the picture and the... Uh, um, you know, uh, there's, they do a little black light to check and it's a valid driver's license and then they'll let me on a plane. We want to do this digitally in a self-sovereign identity model. That same issuer, uh, the Washington State DMV, will, will register a public DID. And when they give me the physical credential, they'll also generate the digital credential. And I will use my digital wallet. I'll, I'll scan a barcode or they can send me a link and I can download a digital version of that driver's license. And it will be signed by the private key for their DID. Uh, it goes into my wallet and now I go uh, to an airport and I go up to a TSA agent and now I can present my phone and uh, I can present a QR code for that credential just like I could present a QR code for my boarding pass for the plane. Um, they would scan that credential and in, you know, uh, in, in ideally less than a second, um, that software pings the, uh, uh, the, the, the blockchain to say, okay, what DID, I've signed that credential as well, I've countersigned it, so they need to check my DID, what's the current public key, they have to check the Washington State DMV, what's the current public key, and if both of those, uh, with those public keys, the signatures verify, they know they have a valid credential that's uh, you know, been presented by the actual holder of that credential. There's a lot more details behind that, but uh, that's the basic process. Um, and I do want to, uh, you know, I, because there are so many questions about this, I'm going to take a second just to explain that with in the sovereign ecosystem, we take two more steps to actually protect your privacy. The first one is both these relationships when you first, when I went to the uh, Washington State DMV, uh, or when I go to the TSA, that first time we actually ex exchange pairwise unique um, DIDs, uh, they're pseudonyms. So everything by default is pseudonymous throughout the infrastructure. And then you layer in uh, correlation where you need it. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a broad infrastructure uh, application of privacy by design. And we think it's critically important to make pairwise unique DIDs the default. And the second key part is that uh, in Sovereign, when you uh, are issuing credentials, they're actually uh, issued using uh, zero knowledge proof. Uh, see the uh, uh, formatting is a little strange here, but that's uh, uh, zero knowledge credential uh, is issued um, and uh, it is cryptographically, cryptographically bound to a specific holder so that you can't, it is very difficult to share that credential with anyone else uh, because only that holder has a special secret for that credential. Um, and then what the holder is able to do is produce a cryptographic proof in zero knowledge about that credential to any verifier. And the power there is they never have to reveal what DID they use with the issuer. Um, and they can just selectively disclose exactly what that verifier needs to know. With, with TSA, they need to know I'm a U.S. citizen and, uh, you know, I, I have the right to fly. Uh, if I present it at a bar, they need to know I'm over a certain age. They don't need to know my birth date or my uh, name or, or, or my address. And the same is true of every credential that we get. If you have a standard protocol for issuing and, and uh, presenting them in zero knowledge, we can make zero, uh, selective disclosure a, a standard on the internet, which of course is tremendously supportive of new privacy uh, initiatives like GDPR and EPR uh, coming from Europe. So that's 
that's the story of, of uh, that's really the, again, the meat in the sandwich. How verifiable credentials happen is, uh, is truly, I, we don't have long enough to go through the whole thing. Uh, in fact, uh, um, I'm gonna strongly suggest that um, uh, Alex invite uh, Manu Sporny from Digital Bazaar to, uh, to, to give you the story because it's, it's worthy of a movie. But in, in a uh, nutshell, um, and there's actually several work, years of work before um, this happened. Uh, Manu Sporting, Dave Longley, the CEO and, and, and uh, CTO and co-founders of Digital Bazaar, um, started the Verifiable Cl uh, Claims Task Force at W3C. Again, that's one of those community groups. It's not an official um, standard yet, but they did that to start building support for uh, a standard for interoperable verifiable credentials. It was a real uphill battle, but they gained supporters and they got up to about 135 companies that said, yeah, we wanna be part of that. So that's when they finally um, proposed that working group uh, formally to the W3C. And it's quite a process. You have to have a, a full vote of the membership uh, at W3C to form a new, work, new working group. Well, turns out there are parties out there in the world that don't want to see um, this problem solved, or, or they don't want to see it solved anytime soon, and they don't want to see it solved uh, by folks that are not currently in uh, positions of power on the internet. I think that's the simple way I'll put it. Um, I'm not going to name any names or or companies or organizations, um, uh, but, but but you can uh, uh, you, hopefully you, you can get the story from uh, from Manu and Dave or others that were involved. But uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, Manu regaled us, a group of about eight of us at, a, uh, um, at, at an SSI uh, uh, dinner that we held in, in Washington DC as, as part of a conference for about two hours with the story of how many times he almost gave up and the fact he thought that it was going to be defeated at the W3C. And finally, um, uh, some of the uh, individuals that had been there a long time said, no, this is not right. We need this. And the right, the right folks have done the right thing to prepare for this. And they, uh, they were able to, uh, when, when all was thought was lost in 24 hours, they turned it around and, and got it approved. And so I'm happy to say that that working group uh, finally started its work last May. It's one year into the job now, uh, making great progress. Uh, including integrating support for sovereign uh, zero knowledge uh, credentials and the, the crypto that's that's now available to do that. And so uh, that's that's the, the final piece of the puzzle that will enable uh, self-sovereign identity, um, you know, the, the infrastructure that we're all building. So I hope that uh, uh, that answers a lot of questions and, and, and raises many more that will be answered in future webinars in this series. And thank you, Alex, very much for the opportunity to present that. Awesome, and um, that was uh, incredible insight. And I think it will help everyone to to understand some of the basics. We will dig much deeper, as you said, in the future into how the IDs happened, DKMs, did off, and verifiable verifiable credentials, but also many other concepts like zero knowledge proofs and many of the other underlying concepts that you need to know, um, even basic things like you know, what is a public key or a private key, um, which uh, many people will need to learn about to, to get closer to this world. Drummond, thank you very much for, for this great presentation. Um, this is an open invitation to everyone in the community um, to, to, to participate and share their knowledge um, from companies, from organizations, and be part of this. So um, as we said before, um, you can um, access um, this presentation. We will share it in the blog, um, in the Telegram group, and, and all the social media channels we can. So this will be widely distributed. An important thing is that um, this is just not a webinar. You will have access to the PowerPoint presentation that Drummond um, um, shared with you today. And you will be able to use this material wherever you are in the world to create your own local SSI communities because that's the main mission and purpose of this whole thing. And we will be talking about it with as many companies as possible in the SSI space um, that want to be part of this um, and individuals and all kind of people in the blockchain SSI world to, to, to make this happen. So Drummond, thank you very much again. And I enjoyed it a lot.
Alex, thank you. It's uh, I think this is going to be a great series. I look forward to future discussions and having uh, everyone in the in the self sovereign identity space uh, participate. This is going to be an extremely um, you know lively, and I, I've already seen it. You know, there hasn't been more excitement about um, innovations in digital identity in the twenty years that I've been working in this space. Um, uh, than now. And, and we all re recognize we're just at the start. So uh, it's really going to be an exciting journey. Thank you, Robert. Talk soon then. Thank you, Alex.